So, Doug, what is the speaker's game plan here? I think, it, well, it is as laid out you know, by Garrett here, is to have a marker and a baseline to go into negotiations and say, you know, okay, I've shown you mine, now what's yours? And of course, the, the Biden plan is a clean debt ceiling, which is what other Republican and Democratic speakers have been able to pass. Yeah, there's a whole lot of politics happening here. First, you have the Republican politics. Shocking. Shocking. Yeah, absolutely. But you have the you start with the Republican internal politics in the House, where um, it started with uh, the Freedom Caucus saying that Kevin McCarthy would not be able to do anything on his own. And while he's, as Garrett said, has given a lot to those members, he actually did do this. This is not regular order, one issue at a time. Meanwhile, he's got a problem for moderates who you know, we all we often hear about the moderates flexing their muscles, but usually having worked in the House. They don't know where the gym is, much less how to build the muscles to then flex the muscles. This will be a testing point for whether or not they can do that. Then if they pass that, we get into the more external politics of Republicans versus Democrats, the usual game. And of course, Susan, out there, there's the markets. And as this gets closer and closer to a deadline, and I don't think any of us think that the problem solvers are going to be able to kick it down, kick the can down the road for 18 months and have a commission decide on fiscal issues. I mean, that's what budget committees are supposed to do. Separately from the debt ceiling is the argument from the White House. We know what commissions are in Washington. They're a way to delay taking action. I think what might happen, though, involving the markets is a TARP-like experience. Remember when that bank bailout went down in 2008 and the markets tanked and it forced Congress to do action that it did not want to do. It may take something like that, a near-death experience like that, to get this debt ceiling, uh, this debt ceiling debate finished in a way that protects our good faith and credit. And Eugene, Republicans today also passed a transgender sports ban for schools. Now this is red meat for, meat for the base, but it's going to be vetoed, you know, if it got through the Senate. Meanwhile, they're not doing anything about guns or a lot of other issues. It, 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 I don't think it's going to get picked up in the democratically held Senate. And you're right, even if it were, um, President Biden has already made very clear he would veto that. You know, this is red meat. This is something they know wasn't going to be passed. This is something that Republicans have been doing for months and months, years now, right? Trying to find use. And if you, you talk to Democrats, and, and most importantly, if you talk to LGBTQ plus activists and advocates, they would say this is using trans people um, as both a cudgel. Um, and also as the boogeyman and woman in them um, of, of America, right? Talking about and looking at them as so different. This is very similar. They point you to what happened and how gay people were villainized um, for years by, by elements of the Republican Party and that this is another layer of that, right? And this was a concern that folks had after um, same-sex marriage came through and went through, and, and now that everyone's kind of used to it, that what is the next thing? And when you talk to these advocates, this is what they're worried about. And most importantly, they're worried about the um, numbers, the vast numbers, um, disproportionate numbers of young trans people who either kill themselves or um, feel scared living in this country where you have folks trying to pass bills like this. And so it's, it's red meat for the base. It's not going to go anywhere. And also, it's interesting. It'll be interesting how the politics of this plays out in general elections, right? People don't typically and have not gone to um, the ballots in strong ways against transgender people. That is something that Republicans have been trying to do, um, but it doesn't seem like it's going to work. So how they do that as we move forward in a presidential, when you have Democrats painting this Republican Party as extremists and pretty extreme on this issue in particular. Um, Susan, I don't know if you want to take on this, if you have a take on how this plays in a general election. Because unlike abortion and other issues, other cultural issues that, like Ron DeSantis is, is trying to play up in Florida, this issue, I'm not sure, has the constituency. No, yeah, it's, it's, it's different. We know how powerful the abortion issue is going to be in the next election as it was in the last one and in a way that is not helpful for Republicans. Uh, you know, this the, the debate over transgender people is something that is still kind of developing in this country. People are trying to figure out what they think about it, what is the, the right thing to do. Um, but our attitudes toward uh, people of different sexual orientations or have differences along those lines has changed, changed in in fundamental ways. And it's a basic ways. civil rights issue. I mean, remember how gay marriage was a big issue that helped elect George W. Bush. That's totally flipped now. The country is in favor of gay marriage. That debate is over. This debate, though, I think is still going on. Well, as again, it's, it's another civil rights issue that is just beginning to emerge in general 
political conversation at least. Um, so a quick question to you, Doug, about the Senate Judiciary Committee now wanting to talk to the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, basically about Clarence Thomas. It's about right. the ethics issue. Does this have legs, as you say? Well, certainly politically, it's going, it's going to have legs. It's a conversation. We've been talking about Clarence Thomas specifically for a long time. Uh, the Chief Justice has been invited. It doesn't mean he's been compelled, and it doesn't mean he's going to show up. Um, if he does, uh, certainly that's going to be, I think it's unlikely that he does, um, something we all focus on. And what will be addressed is, you know, we've been talking so much about Clarence Thomas, but what are the actual ethics rules or lack thereof within the Supreme Court? Are there other Supreme Court members who've gone on similar trips? There's a lot we still don't know. We've learned a lot about Clarence Thomas. There are eight other justices that we may have similar questions well, about. There's a big loophole for those kinds of trips, if you know the person, mm -hmm. if it's a friend. The real issue, I think, is going to come down to the house, the purchase of the house by Harlan Crow, the family home, the renovation, the mother still living there. That... That is a requirement for disclosure. And the ambiguity around what rules govern Supreme Court justices and, how, and the, the, of course, the political actions of his wife are all the, so the subject of kind of ferocious discussion. To be continued also. <laughs>